We've just a week to go now before we're live on stage with the new show, Cocaine Cowboys. Final tickets on sale from mcd.ie, our venues. It's okay. taken us so long to actually get to the point that we <coughs> yeah. can start discussing we're, we're, this. We've even had a legal briefing there um, before we did, well, just so we don't. Sorry. It is better safe than sorry. And so we don't sort of cause any difficulties along the line because there's a lot of connections here. And we're going to talk about these sort of sleeper businessmen who are money laundering. And, um, you know, over the last 10 years, the growth in organized crime and, and the amount of money washing around, largely due to cocaine, is enormous. So all this money needs to be washed. It needs to be laundered. And there's a whole host of people out there. You know, this is typical you wouldn't know what your neighbor's doing kind of thing that there's businesses, all sorts of businesses that are washing money for these guys and people who are using their lack of criminal convictions, their clean past to be of use. Yeah, I mean, if, if your neighbor is driving a 200,000 euro luxury car and they're taking seven holidays a year and they've spent about half a million refurbishing their house, it's not because his plastering business is so successful. You can yeah. be sure they're involved in something else. They may have won the lottery. Yeah, but like, mine aren't it, like it, that, it's, so it's, they're safe. You're all <laughs> safe out there, neighbours. <laughs> But look, I mean, it, should we discuss this before in terms of it? I mean, it's, it's, it must be a third of the activities of any serious crime gang. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, procuring the product and selling it. And, you know, that takes up two thirds of the time and managing and all that. But it takes a third of the time to, to move your money. Um, and over the years, we've seen like the physical stuff where those those huge amounts of cash linked to the cannons that were going out in trucks and they were wrapped in wire mesh to stop the, you know, anyone interfering with the cash or helping themselves to a, a 50 here or a 50 there. And that was being physically transported. We saw the, the NCA in the UK, the National Crime Agency, break up a whole ring of people that I think was a 20 something plus people who were flying out suitcases of cash with 2 million euro and, and 2 million sterling in their suitcases heading out to Dubai. So, I mean, it's, it's probably not the most efficient way, but it's just one other channel. Oh. And and of course, if you have legitimate... Cash as well, of course, don't they? they you know, because some of this stuff goes into these assets like, and it's not easy to put your hand on them then to turn them back into cash. No, and I mean, the idea that, you, you know, you can buy a luxury car uh, and you can move it around and sell it when you need it is fine if you're if you're if you only need 90 grand mm. but when you're making half a million a week it's not going to work for you. You know, you're going to need, as we've seen, you're going to need the whole car dealership and probably 10 or 12 of them yeah. to really kind of make sure that that's going to work for you. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, so when you get to that point, you're going to need people who have business skills and, uh, they, you know, they probably don't teach chartered accountancy in, you know, a two-year course while you're serving your time in Mount Joy. So they're going to be using legitimate business people or people who started out as, you know, legitimate uh, you know, accountants or, or or business people, whatever they're doing, importers, exporters, and you got to wait for a weakness or somebody who's greedy or somebody who's an addiction problem or, or is in debt. who doesn't know. I mean, there are occasions, I mean, um, you know, I know certainly a financier has recently told the Gardaí in relation to the John Spud Murphy, the, the Garda who's serving time in prison. For, he was caught with a load of cannabis out of his house, but he appears to have been, or certainly it's alleged, he was operating as a kind of a go-between for gangs. And he was certainly going to legitimate, um, honest brokers and asking for financial advice, but just saying he was representing a kind of a fund that was in Denmark. This is the allegation that's been made and he wanted to know how to move this money into the Irish property market. Um, from my understanding, the financier who he approached wasn't in the game of money laundering at all. So sometimes they do also try and use the system and people do fall into it innocently. Yeah, and, and there are legitimate reasons why people want to move, you know, two million euro from mm. one country to another. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of Norwegian millionaires or Danish millionaires or, you know, French or whoever who kind of see a, a, a little bit of a carbon sink that they could buy in an Irish forest or they're looking at the Irish property market going up and they want a slice of the action. So there's there's always that kind of business mm -hmm. going on. And, you know, I suppose if you're, if you're at a certain level of financing, it's not unusual. Now, obviously, if you or I certainly turned up in the bank with two million quid in a, in a couple of backpacks, they're going to ask twice about where we got the cash from, yeah. as as would, you know, I think anyone else. But I mean, did, but, you know, like there is that whole, all of the people in the professions like, you know, solicitors or, or accountants, they, they, you know, some of them, quite a lot of them at a certain level will be moving money around and that's part of their job. And, mm. you know, presumably there's all various restrictions and they have to declare things. But if, if it's all above board, 
from you know the source ends. They're doing nothing wrong, and I mean, they, I mean, if they, unless they actually have a really good idea, then they're they're reckless. They're, yes. they're not paying attention when they when they should be. But I think there's a kind of a push on by law enforcement, certainly in this country, to prove that you know, they're going to go after the money launderers as much as they are the actual drug dealers and the kind of the people from the criminal networks. Um, you know, the Criminal Assets Bureau will regularly come upon architects, for example, who have, you know, designed and maybe overseen the building of properties from people who they maybe should have asked questions of. Travel agents maybe who've taken a huge amount of money from young people. And again, they should have asked questions about where it's coming from. So there is a definitely a crackdown on money laundering in this country. And we have seen also the state is going after the women, the wives of certain criminal, um, you know, targets who have maybe in the past been able to allow funds transfer through their bank accounts and claim they knew nothing. They believed it was all to do with the car industry or whatever. But this week there's two businessmen and, and they're they're very interesting characters. Um, and we're going to try as much as we can explain who they're linked to and where they're coming from. The first is a guy called Wesley Williams. And he's been sentenced to two and a half years in prison after pleading guilty to his role in a bogus investment scheme between 2012 and 2014. Williams has no previous convictions and is part of a, uh, has worked in a family business for years and years. He's in his mid to late 40s at this stage. Um, and, you know, but his links are clearly there and he's come up previously in a criminal assets bureau case you covered. Yeah, it was it was a funny one because uh, at the time when it came up in the the, the hearing, whatever it was, uh, I think at the end of 2022, we couldn't name him because this case was coming up. So we had to wait till that was over. Um, but yeah, he, he was mentioned, it was the case against uh, um, Evergreen Wealth Management, which our, our careful listeners will remember is the company that was owned by the, the famous Celtic Tiger socialite Marcus Sweeney. Uh, and so this was this is basically the target property um, that they went after it was worth about one hundred and ten thousand. as a you know a small patch of boggy fields up in in West Meath or Meath somewhere, um, which has since been sold off by the way. And 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 Sweeney of course didn't contest this, but as, as part of that case, it went through all his criminal connections, um, and you know, you know it kind of it, it went about how he some of the money came from legitimate sources. There was people, friends of his, who he took money off uh, to to put into his 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 this this investment vehicle that he had that was going to also of course make everyone rich. This is around two thousand and fifteen or thereabouts. So. A number of people were mentioned then in in the case against him to show his his um, I suppose his association with criminals and and one of these people at, at that time was uh, Wesley Williams who was mentioned in the cab case was being investigation investigator of a one point million uh, 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 money laundering mm. case it was alleged at that time but since then now you know he he was convicted just last week and got a he got a he got a jail sentence got a two and a half years in prison for his for his troubles he pleaded guilty to this it was basically as a bogus investment scheme, I think there was people in... in Is he a director of Marcus Sweeney's company? No, he wasn't a director, um, but he was a co-signature on an account that money went in and out of. Mm. And I suppose with, with Marcus Sweeney's company, he, he was simply an investor. They, they had apparently had put money into EWM. And then when EWM got into trouble with its creditors, which resulted in Marcus Sweeney getting a guard information notice, uh, warning him about a, a credible threat to his life, Wesley Williams then was instructed to negotiate on behalf of the creditors. So we know that the creditors, some of them were, again, these legitimate people who he'd taken money off, some of them friends of his. Um, others were involved in serious crime and one of them was a major, major gangland figure in West Dublin. And this is the person who the Gardaí believed the, the threats were emanating from towards Sweeney. And anyway, a deal was done. And, uh, but the only person really to benefit from it was the, the criminal. I think everyone else didn't really get to see their money returned. And the criminal we're talking about is a significant member of the group we call the family, who are the number one targets of the Guards Drug and Organised Crime Bureau, Ballyfermot based grouping that had initially sort of started out dealing heroin and owning that market, but who have expanded in recent years, especially with the collapse of the Kinahan Empire in this country. They've expanded into cocaine, cannabis, ketamine, MDMA everything. And they've also expanded their geography outwards from Dublin and they've been growing and growing really. Um, and the, the family grouping are known to take advantage of drug addicted people, sometimes in recovery, and they use them to hold their drugs and to um, sort of use them as enforcers as well. 
there's a lot of people being jailed really that have um, been just pawns of the group known as the family. And I think uh, what's interesting here though is what you have is you have Sweeney maybe at the centre of it and you have the foot in the two camps. And one camp is that dangerous underworld and the other is the legitimate sort of middle classes who are probably, you know, seemingly making legitimate money and are clean and have nothing to do with crime. Or can't resist the idea of, of a couple of hundred grand dropping into an account and pretending that they're successful business people when in fact they're effectively, in, in this case, con artists. They were just, mm. you know, it was it was part of a scheme by Ireland's most famous psychic, Simon Gold. Yeah, talk uh, about know. him. So this was what Wesley Williams has pleaded guilty to is part of a scheme that was devised by Simon Gold. Yeah, Simon Gold, also known as Niall O'Donoghue, originally from, I think, somewhere around Roscommon. And it, like he's he's been involved in fraud since the mid '90s when he first got uh, his first case against him. I think it was a, a, an estate agent's company that kind of got into financial trouble, and he basically started um, swindling people. And the judge at the time kind of said, "Look, you've got you've a, you know fantastic skill set. If only you just were an honest business person, mm. you'd probably survive and, and make a decent living." And he he just continued uh, like as he as he started off. I, I remember speaking to. Uh, one person in the west of Ireland, uh, well over, well over fifteen years ago now at this stage, mm. and and uh, you know a, a friend of hers with them who'd been suckered into some kind of a scheme based in Spain. Now this this case has never come up, and she had all the paperwork and was basically stolen from them by by Simon Golds and others who were involved in in setting up people and you know and and giving the impression that they were dealing with a legitimate business mm. i suppose and and the fact that you know simon gold then popped up on the radar again this week with wesley williams kind of shows you how somebody like him his 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 skills are in demand sure like, yeah like he, he was missing for a while there and he, I think we, we did a piece. He's psychic, so that's a good starting point, isn't it? It was the only picture we had of him for ages as well was this kind of strange underlit picture, like, yeah. you know, where, so there's all the jokes about he mustn't have seen the guards coming, et cetera, and so on. But okay. he, he, he was the target of, of Cab um, and we, we weren't really, couldn't get much traction on him. But then he turns up in, of all, he turned up in, a, in, in Wiltshire in England and he had a property company and he hired a number of people working from him on a, a commission only basis. I spoke to one former employee who said they didn't get paid. They never saw a penny from all their hard work. And one particular person apparently was left kind of holding, holding the dog after he he was dis, he disappeared. And there was four different or three different premises where he'd been running what seemed like a you know a big showy um, real estate company, which in fact was just taking money and, and, and like and this is the allegation yeah. that, that there was no business being done, and that he basically didn't come out of his nice mansion. But when he did, he was driving a Porsche Cayenne or he was driving mm. a couple of you know various nice cars. So he looked the part. He looked like a really kind of a successful businessman and the sort of guy that if you invested your money in or with, you could have the same lifestyle. That's the kind of promise from these guys. Yeah, he, he was able, he, he knew how to work the system. I mean, at one point, I think the Criminal Assets Bureau had frozen an account of his with, with something like uh, 800,000 in it. And he walked into the bank and almost persuaded them to unfreeze it. Right. I mean, you know, that's how plausible Those like he, he was coming across. Like, amazing skill set, haven't they? They do, they do. But I mean, some of them, it's inevitable they're going to be caught because they're just, they're leaving a black hole behind them. And yeah. they can't, you know, as much as he changes his name, like he, he, he used, he, he used, I don't know, five or six, at least different, different names that we found. I mean, his real name is Nilo Dunhu. He's, he's kind of, I mean, his most recent court cases has been as Simon Gold. Mm. I mean, when, when he was, his previous conviction, I think it was in 2019, I sat in court and I watched him and he was totally, you know, it was like it was just going on around him. He didn't really seem to care. Like, again, he's, he's one of these people, like, who I, I think I've gone on about this before, one of these people who are just, you know, they're, 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 they can, their level of stress tolerance is just huge. Like, mm. I mean, you or I would be breaking out into a sweat and yeah. twitching and, and fidgeting. They just, <laughs> Whereas people like him, it doesn't matter. It just yeah. doesn't matter. And they don't care about, you know, people crying, explaining that you've, you've, you've left them absolutely broke. You've ruined their retirement, you know, and, like, and people die from this. Like they yeah. die bitter and penniless. And like the sense of violation that you get from, um, you know, being conned by, a, you know, a con artist like this is huge for people. It's like, I've heard it so many times in victims of fraud, yeah. just the, the idea that the feeling, how could I be so stupid? It must've been my fault. And it's not, you're just, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're just unfortunate to meet someone who's really good. And it was even something like our, our colleague, Alan Sherry, doorstepped in there after one court appearance. And uh, and he was kind of saying, look, it's, it's, I've done my time. It's not like anyone was murdered. You know, he's kind of, he's, he's kind There's of minimizing, yeah. he's minimizing what he's done. There's like, a personality know. type, isn't there, that, you know, can 
do that frauds and they keep going back to it no matter what time they do or they, they just keep the repeat offenders repeat 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 and in a way you wonder even okay Simon Gold is is into the big sort of books basically but the, the ones that are into the smaller ones would you wonder is the addiction the actual getting one over on people being cleverer than the other person or is it the money there is I know it's, it's definitely it's the game and mm. I, I think for some of them um I mean, I could I could uh, tell our readers about my nineteen. Oh, sorry, when is it? My my two thousand and eight or whatever it was. My I, no two thousand and ten book called The Fraudsters. Yeah, and there was an FBI guy I, I met one time. I spoke to him about it, and he was saying that the, yeah, they categorize these guys as lifestyle frauders. They, they just go from one trick to the next, and one mark to the next, one scheme to the next, and they know they're going to be caught. Uh, you know, at the back of their minds, they know they're going to be caught, but they're not interested. They just go from one trick to the next. And there's been so many mm. of these guys over the years, like you know, and and some of them are small time but ingenious like I mean the man uh, Carlos Guzman Betancourt who turned up in a Dublin hotel here and persuaded he persuaded the front desk to go up and open the safe and he took out a 50 grand Rolex watch from a room that he didn't book and the watch wasn't his you know and, and he'd been doing this all over the world he turned up in Florida as a kid and trying to claim that he, he'd stowed away from Venezuela from, on, you know, on, on board, whatever it was, uh, uh, some 747, which would have been the longest ever aviation stowaway in history. And and people couldn't find out the truth about him for years and years. Now, he's currently in jail now in the US, having been caught at the, the Canadian-US border. But, he, he, you know, he's just an example of one of these yeah, guys. And there's, there's other... invent themselves yeah, and when the, they the, come out. There's other Irish guys. I mean, there's one particular guy, uh, I remember doing stories about him, and he'd just befriend people, and he, he explained his knowledge of the racing game and he'd, he'd go into a pub and he'd give people a couple of tips and generally they were, they were good and so he immediately you know befriending people and gets to the point where he's given the keys to lock up at the pub right. and of course he's gone with the yeah. takings yeah. you know and oh we're turning up at stable yards looking for um, looking to borrow a car for like, that moment when the trust is given to him <laughs> given those keys that's his buzz like but interestingly these guys like Simon Gold sort of end up becoming of use to the criminal underworld as well. Hugely useful. I mean, back in the the mid, sort of about 2014, a guy called James O'Gorman, who was a sort of an underworld fraudster, he washed up into the Mansfield house, like with an office and moved into the house. It was a time that the Mansfields were desperately trying to raise funds in order to buy back some of their assets and pay off some of the the dirty debts that were causing them problems, Jim Jr. in particular. Um, was sort of managing all that and O'Gorman moves into the house and, um, you know, is under investigation now for setting up this really successful VAT scheme, which is, you know, still part of a, a criminal investigation. Um, but it it it's suspected that there was tens of millions taken from the exchequer in that. Uh, you know, there's they're a skill set that's of use to them in sort of the the legitimate world where they can trick people. And then within the criminal underworld where they want money to be washing around and they're always criminals, no matter how much they're earning through their own, be it drug dealing or whatever, they still can't help themselves seeing a little bit of another number on a VAT scheme or something. Sure, they can't. They, they always go for the next one. Yeah. And look, I mean, I'm sure they, they pay handsomely for people yeah. with these skills, yeah. either to teach other people. Like, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of, you know... Um, I imagine in any jurisdiction, somebody from a revenue or a tax background is going to be hugely useful. And I'm mm. sure it has happened, like in maybe not in Ireland, but quite possibly. But, you know, around the world, if I was, you know, an international drug dealer, I'd be looking for a banker. I'd be looking for a tax mm. expert. I mean, it would be top of your list. You know, <laughs> you know I really would. Just to, just to know how to move money around and know where the red flags go up and, and to know which jurisdictions to use and which ones not and to use. And they must know one another. I mean, it's funny with Wesley Williams, I can't name some of the people that I know he would have been associated with, but they pop up in other areas of money laundering with kind of significant criminal outfits, including the Kinnahans. Yeah. I mean, in particular, he would have been associated with a builder who um, seems to have had been of use, shall we say, to a, a wide range of groupings. Um, the second businessman that was convicted but given a suspended sentence was a guy called Silvio Rabbit. Now, obviously, there was a little bit of Italian there somewhere, was there? Who's Silvio Rabbit? Well, well I mean, he, he was he, he was lucky enough he came off as the bit player. He, he was the co-signatory on this company account that, uh, along with Wesley Williams, that was accepting this money coming from basically investors, uh, I think, in Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands, who were basically being conned out of 4 million euro in total. They were, this is what they thought were, it was a down payment 
Um, I, I think it was for buying buying agricultural land or buying kind of swathes of forestry, as far as I remember. And at the at the the brainchild of this is Simon Gold. And, and Simon Gold would have been would have been the guy who kind of invented yeah. the scheme. Now everything didn't nothing. Sorry, didn't exist. The whole thing was a yeah. complete you know uh, pie in the sky. It was a fantasy. Yeah. So I mean, you have to admire, I suppose, Gold's skill that he can not only persuade himself that all this exists, but he can persuade people around him that yeah. it exists. Um, and so I think Sylvia Rabbit was, uh, he was kind of seen, I think, in court as he was the guy who was duped, and but he was reckless that, you know, there was 420,000 went into an account, like it was 1.2 million went into an account and, and, and 420,000 mm-hmm. kind of uh, was his. But he was, you know, and, and this had all been put to him by, by Williams and Gold as, look, you know, we're going to be trading we're going to, you know, use our use our, our companies here in Ireland to, to to set up these trades and we're going to get a big commission out of a big fat commission. So, I mean, it's just a fabulous, like brilliant, you know, business scheme where, you know, what could possibly go wrong? And of course, the, 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 the hook was that it was just illegal, that it was yeah. a criminal act. And of course, the company was called One Stop Shop Catering Limited, which is nothing really to do with agricultural land, has it? With or, or international finance, I would yeah. imagine either. Like it, it doesn't, but I mean, you know, I mean, like, but that, that was the genius of gold that if you, if you, if you look at some of his companies that he set up, it was things like with Anglo-Irish in it, like Ang- Anglo-Irish capital investments or, you know, it, there was, you know, and, and that's something you, you, you can make up, you know, these blue blooded uh, sounding names. Like if you call something, I know Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Boston Investments Limited, you think, oh, that's a real thing. Like, you know, I mean, if you call it, you know, uh, you know, Chicken Dylan, you know, it's not going <laughs> to, it's not going to attract the same sort of sense of gravitas, even though, you know, it, the it, Chicken Dylan could be the legitimate Anglo company. Irish based in London at one stage, wasn't that what he had? A company, Gold, didn't he have a company, Anglo-Irish, and it was in London? He, he had, well, it purportedly in London. I mean, most of these things didn't, didn't exist. exist. Yeah. Like, you know, they didn't really exist. Because I remember looking at that years ago, um, the Criminal Assets Bureau work, throwing an eye over it. And uh, they were certainly interested in the idea that um, some very significant IRA figures were kind of seen knocking around it and were possibly interested in it as a as another uh, arm of laundering money. Armour resistance. Mm. So there's, a, there, there's, you know, particularly Ireland, I suppose, we are such a small country that these guys are finite, even though we talk about them being in all sorts of businesses and everything. But there are a finite amount of them. If we were in the criminal industry at the moment and we had a load of money to launder, we'd probably have about 10 names in our phone that we could contact and see what they were doing at this particular point in time and would any of those scams interest us. Yeah, but I'm convinced as well there's another 10 that we've never heard of and that the guards have never heard of and revenue have never heard of. They might have suspicions about one or two. And I mean, it was something that was said to me by, you know, a former senior officer in CAB years ago. Um, and we're talking about Dylan Craven, who we spoke about recently doing this massive va- carousel VAT fraud of which he was he was acquitted in the UK, but still agreed to hand over 17 and a half million sterling. And he's now serving time for a boiler room scam. Anyway, just to get all that out. But uh, he's convinced the only reason he was caught was because he just didn't stop. He kept, you know, he kept spinning the carousel, the carousel. And he said, you know, there's, there's there, without a doubt, there's several, if, if, you know, there's dozens and dozens of business owners out there who they use that carousel as well. But they only spin it once every four or five years. You know, they're not greedy. Yeah. They'll, they'll play the trick once mm. and they'll, they'll wait and see. Um, it'll pay you know, for the lifestyle and then it'll pay. It'll, it's a little bit or they invest it back in the company or, you know, they'll, yeah. it'll it'll cover a hole in their own losses or to some extent. Or again, you know, maybe it's the World Cup is coming up and they want to get good seats in yeah. the stadium or nice hotel and all the rest of, for whatever reason. Um, but that the guys who are able to kind of balance it and don't go into the lifestyle fraud, like, you know, like Simon Gold, where you're you're doing it for the hit as opposed mm. to the money. I mean, the guy never, he doesn't seem to have a bean anytime, you know, we've, we've seen a property he's been in. Like there was one of them we looked at um, down down in uh, in I think Roscommon, and it was just very ordinary, you know, a little bit down a heel, and that. He, Where he, is he now? He he's out. I don't know. He's somewhere in Ireland. Yeah. Like he, he, Under a different he, he was name. Waiting. I uh, well, I, I don't think he's in hiding. There's no charges against him. He served his time. He got seven and a half years mm. um, for his part in this scheme that we're talking about um, involving Wesley Williams. Uh, and, but he was out within four years. He, he I think he, he spent it in uh, most of it in in uh, Lock and House, the open prison, which he told our colleague was absolutely wonderful spot and really enjoyable. And he says, you know, more should be done for prisoners to, you know, to educate themselves and to help re- rehabilitate them and assured everyone that, you know, he was no danger to the public and that mm-hmm. he didn't kill anyone, you know. But that's, I mean, this is the rubbish that I think these guys come out with all the time. That's, I think, why the sort of the money laundering end of things that they are these sort of 
sort of semi-respectable businessmen, sometimes they get caught and they go to jail, right? But a lot of the time they don't. And they're running these businesses and they're a little bit, they feel that they are a little bit tricky, just a little bit tricky. But in actual fact, they are absolutely part of the fabric of organised crime. And they're, they've as much blood on their hands, really, as those who pull the triggers. Yeah, I mean, you can justify it in your own mind any way you want. But when it comes down to it, you are, you're part and parcel. You're, you're part of the, the infrastructure. You're part of the piping, the networking, the ducting, whatever you want to put it. That it would be so much more difficult for like, you know, the, the top end organized crime camps to operate if they didn't have people like this. And I mean, like... It just, but I suppose money is like water. It's going to find its own level and it's always going to pressurize, you know, whatever's holding it in. So if there wasn't a money launderer in Ireland, one would turn up, you know, like, you know, somebody saying like, God damn it, we need to get a, a proper money laundering operation going in Ireland. They can't seem to work one out for themselves. And we'd have an English, an American or a German doing it for them. So, I mean, it's it's just the, the, the sheer power of, you know, the cocaine cash is just going to, it's going to find, it's going to, it's going to break through at some point. And like, you know, of course, I use your account for the vision net, but you know, when we go looking for, as you discovered the other day when you got an email from me, but as we... Spending a lot of money, actually. I actually, I put it in and you just come up on your password and everything. I don't know why I have that, but anyway. Um, it's the only one we have. Is it? <laughs> it's, we all use it. Right. So, um, but what I was going to say to you was, you know, when you start dabbling and you're looking at somebody and I do find the kind of the financial and the money laundering kind of investigations are just so vast. Sometimes when you start... You key in a name and up come about 300 companies, some of them normal, some of them dissolved, some of them gone into liquidation, but you're just, oh my God. And then you click on one of them that could have been, you know, 20 years ago and you see these names, co-directors, and it's just this shit show. Isn't it? Yeah. But it seems like in Ireland you can open a company really goddamn easy. Well, I was going to say, and then after you've done that, hit up Lancaster House and get the British records yeah. and you'll find just as many uh, with the same people involved. I mean, it's, look, I mean, it's there for business. It's it, like, it's one of the great things about Ireland. There's, there's very little red tape. That's what international, you know, business people say. You can come in here and set up and get going much quicker than you can in a lot of other countries. Right. And, and that's a very, very basic. And so if people are, are, are abusing it, like, I mean, to some extent, what can you do now? We do know that there seems to be a clampdown at the minute. And there's quite a number of companies that have been linked to criminals and convicted criminals, uh, which are being uh, listed for being dissolved. I mean, we talked about mm. uh, John Kuhn recently, like the, the firm, I think, that his wife had. That's been, that was listed for, for a strike off. We know that there was a big car firm in Limerick that was target of a cab and that's uh, dissolved now as well. Mm. But like they were still live on the books up until like, you know, a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. And there's there's quite a few of them. A couple of like, years yeah. after the cops have kicked the place in and taken more cars than they've yeah. ever taken before. And, and where it's described as the biggest money laundering scheme operating in Ireland in, in the criminal underworld. And yet it still goes. The company still well, it exists, but I mean, most of them aren't active, really. You know, it's on. It, they exist most on paper. Most were never active anyway, were they? They weren't really. No, no, some of them. Some of them. Uh, you, you'll see. Um, they were set up whatever time, and then there's a change of directorship, and then that's it. You'd never see anything again. There's no. There's no accounts ever lodged. There's no. There's no kind of activity, and they're just. You know, for whatever reason, it was set up to set up possibly a bank account at the time, mm. so they can have it, and that, and that was all. That was the whole reason for it and that there was never any intention to run a legitimate company. Mm. You know, you talk about the Simon Gold and his ideas of selling land that doesn't exist and properties that don't exist and developments that never happen and all the rest of it. But 2010, I mean, you were at the offices of what was it, Greenway? Oh, you got me now. No, it wasn't. Yeah, the one in Estepona belonging yeah. to the Kinnans. Green and they're, they're, something, wasn't it? Um, yes, green something, you're right. <laughs> green something. Green securities. Green, green securities. Green securities. We'll go with that, yes. And they're, and they're billion dollar investments in northern, north, northeastern Brazil. Brazil, right. Yeah. Now, so at that time, that was obviously the, the, the Operation Shovel into the Kinnans in 2010. And this office was discovered and they... Guard, the Guarda Seville moved in and they seized all the documents and they sort of put out that the Kinnahans had bought a corner of Brazil's kind of golden coast and sure enough the land existed and you could look and of course we sent journalists down to see what was supposed to be like the, the likes of the kind of K Club, a big huge country mansion club with holiday homes, with a hotel, with a golf club, with all sorts of 
things like that on it, a really attractive looking holiday resort place. And of course, when the journalists went down, they found the, you know, there was a shovel nearly left in the ground and that was it. There hadn't been a road built. There was nothing. The place was absolutely abandoned. It was a piece of land, all right, but it was quite worthless. And then, of course, the Brazilian system wasn't so easy for the Spanish legal authorities to try and find all the sort of documents relating to the ownership of those lands and those sites and all the rest of it. And on that went until the investigation fell apart. And there is suspicions that maybe that was almost set up by the Kinnahans as a ruse in order to sort of suck up the resources of the of law enforcement. Um, having said that, I did meet an individual here in Ireland who had invested. And this was an individual who was um, coming up to retirement and it was probably, what, 26, 27-ish and everything had gone crazy. There was a time that you could have aspired to have a second, you know, a holiday home, I suppose, if you were, if you'd worked all your life and you had your own mortgage paid off. That was gone because the property market in Ireland was gone so crazy. You know, Europe was pretty much gone. The classic places like the south of Spain, Portugal, all that was gone. Mad money. Too much for this ma man to invest. Even Sunny Beach in Bulgaria was gone a bit crazy. He, he had sort of missed the boat with that one. And all of a sudden, this salesman was pitching sites and a house in Brazil. And it looked like one of the last affordable places that was going to come up. And this, you know, you'd buy your site, you'd buy your house pre it was built. And then if you wanted to, you could sell it when it was built. And he was sucked in and it was maybe 20,000, which isn't 200,000, but 20,000 is a lot for somebody who has saved that over years and years of hard work and putting away bits, you know, every month. And he had made that investment and he was somebody who was kicking himself. But that money had just washed straight into the Kinnahans. Yeah, oh, why did they need that man's money? Well, of course, at the time they did yeah. because they wanted to buy bigger shipments. But, but I mean, the, the company did exist. Like, you know, I had, um, it was on, I remember it was on the second floor of a commercial complex yeah. and, the, the, you know, it was a, a nice looking office. It was empty. It was closed by the time we got there. But the, the website was still operational and there was a number of um, the people involved. And I think I briefly spoke to some person, a guy with an English accent who kind of hung up straight away. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it took a while before the, the, the website disappeared. But I mean, it did exist. I mean, and they obviously were like uh, pitching this at people. And it's quite possible that it, it might have gone ahead. I, you know, it's hard to tell really. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe it did work as a, you know, uh, happily for the Kinnahans, it, it worked as a kind of a dead end for investigators because essentially nothing happened or it fell apart. Because, I mean, 2010 was, you know, pretty much, you know, the, the global financial crisis started in 2008 and, and kind of hit, uh, you know, kind of hit, hit Ireland in 2010. Mm -hmm. But it was already in, in full swing at that stage when Operation Shovel kicked off. So, I mean, it, it would have been a great time for a cash, yeah. a cash rich um, criminal gang, though, to be around. We know... What was the figure? I think $356 billion worldwide of drug gang cartel cash went into the, the legal banking system during the financial crash, oh my God. which is a figure I, every time I kind of say it, I go back and I check it again to make sure I haven't made it up or, it's but it, it no, like, no, it. but it is, it's, it's, it was, it was in a UN report um, and there was a couple of banks they were talking about how, um, you know, banks in Mexico had, the, the, the guys who used to make extra long boxes so they could fit through under the, the bulletproof glass. So they were able to lodge thousands at a time instead of small amounts of money. Right. We're in the wrong business, I think, Eamon. We're not. We're in a nice, happy, easygoing, legitimate business, Nicola. Easygoing. <laughs> I don't know about that. Right. Well, look, I mean, they're just, as we say, two of those mm -hmm. um, sort of businessmen who have sort of washed up now in court and who've been sort of named and shamed for their part in money laundering for criminal networks, in particular Wesley Williams and lesser so Silvio yeah. Rabbit. And there's more coming from this network mm. coming down the line. There's more so. coming from this network, but there seems to be more and more coming all the time. I mean, you know, week in, week out, we're seeing people getting charged, pleading guilty largely to money laundering offences. Um, it's difficult, I suppose, if the evidence is ag against you when it comes to money laundering to try and unravel yourself from it, isn't it? Well, it, there's just, there's a paper trail yeah. or an, an electronic paper trail. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah. And I mean, it's regulated in Ireland. So, I mean, it, you can't really hide a transaction in your bank account because you don't actually control your bank account. The bank does. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and the guards in Ireland have become good at it. Um, you know, you know, the, I know the Economic Crime Unit do their own thing separately, but I'm sure there's plenty of experience that, 
the Criminal Assets Bureau have passed on. I'm sure plenty of officers have been through both units or whatever. Um, and they're, they're, they've just gotten better at it. I mean, if you, people have the skills now, they know exactly when somebody says, my money's been stolen, it's gone to this bank account, I sent it the wrong one, they know exactly what to do. There's things are set up now mm. and they can quickly get the money frozen. They can get the, they know they need to get the, the ATM, CCTV and all this kind of stuff. And mm. they're, they're able to do it. I mean, even, even like sitting in a circuit court this week for another case, like there was, I think there was three other money laundering cases coming up at this level, like, you know, and some of them are, you know, we're, we're the dumb students, which I, you know, one of our, our colleagues in Kerry wrote a huge piece about last week, about 1.3 million, I think, in Kerry alone was was laundered by young people who kind of just thought this was a handy 200 quid. Mm. Um, and then, like, when you see it, some of them know what they're doing. Like, certainly one of the cases, there was a guy with previous convictions and it was 25,000 euro and had set up new accounts. And then others were just kind of, you know, it was it was a mistake. Somebody just made an error, mm. like, you know, and they mm. kind of were allowed themselves to be persuaded. So, but I mean, it's a criminal conviction. Yeah, certainly. Okay, well, look, we'll, we'll come back to others uh, along the way, but if anybody knows where Simon Gold is, a.k.a. What is it? Nilo Donahue is his other Nilo name. Donahue. No, you can't miss him. Just, just Google Actually, him and have a, on, have a look on the Sunday World and you'll see his picture. You'll see his weird picture. I always thought Simon Gold was such a cool name, like, and then Nilo Donahue, sorry, Nilo Donahue, 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 Nilo